Today was the reveal of the upcoming United in Stormwind expansion. And they talked about a lot of stuff. They're going to be doing Battleground stuff. There's cosmetic stuff. But I just want to see the new cards. So I think we've got 16 of them to go over today. First up, we have Heavy Plate. This is a warrior spell. Three mana, tradable, gain eight armor. So tradable is one of the new keywords in the expansion. And the way it works is when the card is in your hand, you can drag it over your deck. And then for one mana, you can shuffle it into your deck and draw a card. So this is the, uh, this is just the little clip they showed. You take the card out of your hand, hover it over your deck, swap it out for another card, basically. And that does cost one mana. It's not totally free. But uh, my first impression of the keyword is that the keyword itself just seems overpowered. It's basically just one mana draw a card. It's not quite one mana draw a card. Uh, when you shuffle the card into your deck, you can't draw it immediately, similar to mulliganing a card. But you can still draw it later in the game. So you're not thinning your deck the way that you would be if it was just draw a card. But it's close enough, I would say. And we've seen, like, Power Word Shield was a very strong card at uh, one mana draw card, went in most free stacks. Uh, we've even seen plenty of decks over the years have played Novice Engineer, which is two mana draw a card. So one mana draw a card is a very powerful effect. And then on top of that, all these tradable cards also have other scenarios where you can use them. So, like, Heavy Plate here. Three mana gain, eight armor. I mean, that's not an incredible card. But there will be situations where you want to play three mana gain, eight armor. And in any other situation, it's just one mana draw a card. So, I feel like this keyword is just really strong. I feel like pretty much any card that's even remotely playable in its regular form, if it has tradable on it, it's probably just going to see play. And I'm actually a little bit worried that if they make too many tradable cards, then like every deck is just going to be full of tradable cards and everyone's just going to be drawing their whole deck every single game because they have so many one mana draws. And then decks are going to become like so consistent because they have so much card draw. Like right now we have the like priest problem where they generate too many cards and it's like too much randomness. But we've seen in the past with like Gen and Baku, when things are too consistent, that's also a bit of a problem. And I'm concerned that if there are too many tradable cards, we might be going in that direction. But maybe I'm getting ahead of myself with that evaluation. Obviously, I haven't actually played with the keyword myself yet. But uh, I know that one mana draw a card is pretty good. And heavy plate, three mana gain, eight armor. Sometimes you want to do that against aggro. So it just seems playable. Next up, we have another tradable card. This is a neutral, 3 mana 3 3 with Rush. So, we've seen in the past, uh, I think it was called Rabid Worgen. It was a warrior minion, 3 mana 3 3 with Rush. It saw a little bit of play, uh, mostly because of Town Crier, but still, the card was playable. So, this card seems playable, depending on what kind of stuff you want to be killing with a 3 3 Rush. It has the tradable keyword, which I think is pretty insane. Uh, one of the things about control decks against aggro is you don't actually need a good answer every turn. You just need some kind of answer. So, like, you don't need to completely deal with your opponent's board. You just need to deal with it a little bit until you can get up to enough mana to play, like, a more powerful uh, comeback card or something like that. So, 3 mana, 3-3 three, three rush against aggro. You kill your opponent's 2-drop. That's fine. But then when you're not against aggro, or even sometimes against aggro, it's just one mana draw card. So, like, I think this card might just be pretty good. If I'm properly evaluating the tradable mechanic, then I think this card probably sees play. This card will probably be a pretty good gauge of how good the tradable mechanic is. Like, if this card sees play, the mechanic's probably too strong. And if it doesn't see play, then I'm probably overrating it. But uh, in general, I would say it's probably a good card. Now, next up, we have the Rust Rot Viper. 3 mana, 3, 4 beast with tradable and battle cry, destroy your opponent's weapon. So 3 mana, 3, 4 ooze, but it also has tradable. Uh, this is probably like the most 
significant application of tradable, which is putting it on a tech card. Because the thing with playing Ooze is, like, it's really sick when it hits Doomhammer, but sometimes you draw it when your opponent doesn't have a weapon, or against an opponent that can't even play a weapon. And uh, you feel bad having a tech card in your deck. But if your tech card is also just one mana draw a card in other matchups, then there's not that much downside to playing it. So, as I've said, tradable mechanic seems OP. And if there's any weapons in the meta, you probably just play this card. And uh, it turns out that they're introducing some new weapons, like uh, Warlock and Paladin both get like zero mana weapons that kind of have passives, similar to the weapons back from Kobolds and Catacombs. I don't know if every class is getting a weapon like that, but it kind of seems like they might be. So it seems like maybe you just put this card in like every deck, because it's a tech card that's sick when it hits, and there's very little downside to including it. So, uh, yeah, this card seems really good. Next up, we have, I believe, our final tradable card that's been revealed so far, which is Fire Sail for Mage. Four mana, tradable, and deal three damage to all minions. So, it's a, a board clear at basically the same level as Hellfire. We know Hellfire's a good card. This has a broken keyword strapped to it. So, it's good. Not really much to say about it. It's also a fire spell, which is potentially relevant for the next mage card that we're going to see. And uh, I guess we'll just get into the next mage card, because there's not much to say about fire sale other than it's just a really good card. So this mage spell is Sorcerer's Gambit, and it's a quest line. So the way quest lines work is they're basically quests. They're one mana spells. They start in your opening hand. Uh, you play them just like a quest. And then you have some objective to complete and you get a reward. But for quest lines, you have three objectives that give you three rewards. So the first one is relatively small. We see that this is... Okay, so the quest line for it is cast a fire, frost, and arcane spell. And the reward is just draw a card. And then after that, you move on to the second part of your quest line. Which, uh, this one happens to be the same quest line which is cast Fire, Frost, and Arcane Spell, but this time your reward is Discover One, which I guess is a Fire, Frost, or Arcane Spell. And then finally on the third phase, again, you have to cast Fire, Frost, and Arcane Spells, but this time your reward is Arcanist Dawn Grasp. And that is going to be a 5-mana 7-7 seven, seven with Battle Cry. For the rest of the game, you have Spell Damage plus 3. So... Obviously, just giving your hero spell damage plus three is pretty insane. In theory, that's, you know, really big board clears or a lot of damage sent to the opponent's face. But with this quest line in particular, it does seem pretty slow. Over the course of the three stages, you have to cast nine relatively specific spells. You have to have, over the course of it, uh... 3 Fire, 3 Frost, and 3 Arcane. The second stage does help you a little bit. You get to discover one. And uh, the first stage you draw a spell, so that probably helps as well. But uh, you still need to cast, or you still need to have like 7 other spells on top of those. And I think the Arcane spells are generally pretty good. But there aren't that many good Fire spells. There aren't that many good Frost spells. So it is definitely something you need to... Uh, work your deck around a bit. Um, and then you finally get Arcanist Dawn Grasp, which is a good card, but because it takes so long to get it, you play this at like, I don't know, turn 10 or whatever. By that point, like, do you even really have the spells to abuse this? Mage doesn't actually have that much burn right now. They have like Rune Orb, Fireball, Mask of Cthulhu. Um, I think that might be it. I guess they have a Pexus Blast as well. But it's not like we have Arcane Missiles anymore. We don't have Frost Bolt. So basically, it might be like a little late in the game to really be able to abuse this reward. But it does seem like this just kind of slots pretty nicely into Spell Mage. It shouldn't be that hard to play, you know, five or six of each kind of spell. I think they already play a bunch of Arcane Spells. 
So maybe this just slots pretty nicely into that deck. I don't know if it's really going to have a chance outside of that, just because you need so many spells to support it. But that is, like, the best mage deck right now, so, you know, it's fine if it's only, if it only happens to be good in that mage deck. So I'm a little bit skeptical that you can really abuse the reward with this card in the deck that can complete the quest line. But if you can find the right build of the deck for it, it's obviously very strong. Next we have a Warlock quest line. So it functions the same as the Mage. It's a three-part quest basically with two small rewards and then one big reward. So this one is take six damage on your turns and then you get a lifesteal, deal three damage to the enemy hero. Then you have to deal seven to yourself on your turns. And then you get lifesteal, deal three damage to the enemy hero. So same reward on the first two. And then there's deal eight damage, or take eight damage on your turns. And then your reward is Blightborn Tamsun, which is five mana seven seven with battle cry. For the rest of the game, damage you take on your turn damages your opponent instead. So that's obviously a very powerful effect. That means if you play, you know, Flame Imp, you get a 3-2 and it deals 3 damage to your opponent instead of dealing 3 damage to you. Uh, probably the biggest payoff with this card is going to be Stealer of Souls, which is when you draw a card, make it cost health instead of mana. So after you play the Blightborn Tamsin, then you go Stealer of Souls and tap. Your opponent takes the 2 damage from the tap and you tap into, you know, Yasharaj or whatever for 10 mana, which is actually just 0 mana, deal 10 damage to your opponent. So it's it's pretty easy to like see how this is actually a win condition. And even more than that specific example, maybe the win condition with Tamsin is just fatigue. You just build a Warlock deck that draws all your cards, you play Tamsin, and then your opponent just starts dying when you're out of cards. Like that seems like it could be a win condition. So the reward on this, I think, is definitely very powerful. Uh, the problem is going to be taking 6 damage on your turns, or over the course of the whole quest, it's taking 21 damage. Uh, dealing 21 damage to yourself, basically. And that's a lot of damage. You do lifesteal for 3 twice, so the uh, like the net result is that you only have to take 15 damage, but you still have to actually deal 21 damage to yourself so i mean that's life tapping like 11 times that's a lot of life taps and actually it's more than that right because i don't think like if you over damage yourself on one part of the quest line i'm assuming the excess damage probably doesn't apply to the next one so basically if on the first one you somehow deal eight damage to yourself you still have to deal seven to complete the second half of it or the second third of it i would imagine so it probably does take a while to complete this, is basically what I'm getting at. But considering that Fatigue is probably the best way to use Blightborn Tamsin, maybe it's fine if this takes forever. You just, you know, play it on one, and you really don't have to invest that much effort into finishing it in a timely fashion, because you have all of your cards in your deck to eventually finish the quest line. So yeah, basically I could see this card definitely seeing play, um, I don't know if it's a better win condition for a slow warlock than, like, Ticketus, or uh, the guy that makes all the imps every turn. I don't know if this is going to be warlock's best win condition, but it seems pretty reasonable. I think we're probably going to need to see another card in this set that damages yourself. But, I mean, we already have, like, Raise Dead, which is a really good card. We have Backfire, Flame Imps. It might be fine as is, but I think I would like to see another self-damage card. Now, moving on from quest lines, I guess we'll look at some of these weapons that I briefly referenced earlier. So this is Runed Mithril Rod, a Warlock weapon. 3 mana, 0, 2. After you draw 4 cards, reduce the cost of cards in your hand by 1. Lose 1 durability. So, basically, this is 2 Emperor Thorazen effects for 3 mana. Obviously, it's not that straightforward. You have to draw a total of eight cards to get both of those. But, I mean, you're drawing a card every turn just naturally. And life tap 
also draws you a card every turn if you want it. Warlock also just has, like, Backfire. So you can just play this on three, and then on turn four, you draw your natural card. You play Backfire, you've drawn four cards, and you discount your hand. Uh, that specific scenario, maybe you'll just have too many cards, but it's pretty easy to get the effect out of this, I would say. And as Warlock, you pretty much always have, like, nine cards in your hand. So this is giving you massive, massive discounts. Uh, it's pretty hard for me to imagine this card not being really good. I mean, obviously... Well, I was going to say, obviously, you don't play this in Zoo, but I'm not entirely sure that that's obvious. You probably don't, though, because it's the three mana do nothing, basically, the turn you play it. But uh, I think pretty much any slow Warlock deck is interested in playing this card. Uh, the Ticketus builds, the Self Mill builds, the Self Damage builds. Emperor Thorson's a good card. This is two Emperor Thorsons. It's a good card. Next up, we have the Paladin Weapon, Prismatic Jewel Kit. And uh, these are not legendary weapons, by the way. They kind of seem like they would be, since they're, like, passive weapons, similar to the Kobolds and Catacombs ones. But uh, they're just normal weapons, like this one's a rare. I think the last one might have also been a rare. Uh, anyway, 1 mana, 0, 3. After a friendly minion loses Divine Shield, give minions in your hand, plus 1, plus 1, lose 1 durability. So basically three times you can hand buff yourself if you can manage to find a Divine Shield minion. So Divine Shield minions, I think we have Righteous Protector in Standard, we have Goody Two Shields, we have Murger, Murgurgle, so, and probably some others. There's the big Carousel Griffin. So Paladin definitely has some playable Divine Shield minions. But uh, they also have the weapon from Wailing Caverns, which is a 3 minute 2 3 with Death Rattle. Uh, you give all your minions divine shields. And one of the problems with that weapon is that it's 3 mana and it's got 3 durability, so it takes a while to break. So you can just break it with Prismatic Jewel Kit, give all your stuff divine shield, and then you can just trade 3 minions in and buff your hand plus 3 plus 3. So like that's potentially a very strong synergy. Now, one drawback to that is that you're going to need to have, you know, the three minions in play and both of the weapons. So how big is your hand really? But even if you're only buffing a couple of things, this is one mana give your hand plus three plus three, right? Situational, obviously, but we've seen like conditioning sees play in Warrior, and that's, you know, pretty conditional itself. So, uh, I mean, in theory, this is a very powerful card. I don't know if it's necessarily going to fit in, like, a Librem deck, because those decks, they play spells. I don't think they naturally play that many Divine Shields. But I could certainly see this seeing play in some sort of aggressive Paladin deck that uh, is willing to be built a little bit around Divine Shields. And all the Divine Shield minions I mentioned are already pretty high quality. So, seems like a solid card. Next up, we have a couple of mount cards, which are like a pseudo-mechanic of the set. So this is Ramming Mount for Hunter. Three mana, give a minion plus two, plus two, and immune while attacking. When it dies, summon a ram. So the ram is also a two-two that has immune while it's attacking. So if you remember Spike Ridge Steed from uh, Ungoro, I think is the set that was in. It's basic. these mounts are basically the same thing. You give a minion a buff, and then when that minion dies, it summons a minion equivalent to the buff, right? So this just seems like a pretty solid buff card. Uh, we've seen in the past some um, two mana plus two plus two cards that have been reasonably strong, have definitely seen some play. This costs a little bit more, but Death Rattle Summon a 2-2 is a pretty strong effect. Uh, and of course it has the immune while attacking, so, I mean, you can kind of think of that as sort of a Divine Shield. Divine Shield's a pretty strong uh, keyword to slap on a buff. And it's actually a Divine Shield that if they can't kill it immediately, you can use it again the next turn, because it's just any time it's attacking. So yeah, it just seems like a pretty solid buff card. Um, also, something to note about this is that uh, it's a 3-mana spell in Hunter, which is relevant because of Barak Kodobane. Currently, the only real playable three mana spell for that is the Mancrick, whatever, Olgra card, which obviously is better to hit than the Ramming Mount, 
but that also relies on finding one legendary playing it and then finding another legendary and playing that so ramming mountain can add some consistency to barack kodobane as well so yeah it seems like a good card on its own has a little bit of support with another uh another hunter card that's already good on its own as well just seems like a strong card um i don't necessarily know if you want to play this in like the current iteration of face hunter i guess it is three mana deal two damage which i mean is not that efficient but with all the other stuff going on with it maybe it's just good enough to see play in that deck but it might be a little bit clunky if we don't find a more mid-range-ish hunter build Next up, we have the Elec Mount for Priest. Seven minion, seven mana. Give a minion plus four, plus seven, and taunt. When it dies, summon an Elec. The Elec, of course, is a four seven with taunt. So this one is very directly comparable to Spike Ridge Steed. And uh, I mean, we know Spike Ridge Steed was a really good card at six mana, two six. This is seven mana, four seven. Seems like better stats for the rate. Um, yeah, I mean, it just seems like a good card. Priest also has the benefit that they have, uh, palm reading, so they can discount this pretty easily. They've got, you know, Sethic Veilweaver that cares about this kind of stuff. I guess they also have Nazmani Bloodweaver that can discount this. I mean, it just seems like a good card. I guess compared to Paladin with the Spike Ridge Steed, Priest doesn't necessarily dominate the board as well. Like, that was one of the good things about Spike Ridge Steed, is you could just... You could even play, like, an aggro deck and just cap out at Spike Ridge Steed, because you just controlled the board so well as a Paladin. Priest doesn't really do that, but Priest kind of can do that if they want. So, it's a little bit hard to say if Priest can really abuse this card, but the power level of it is definitely high, and I think it's probably not that hard for Priest to abuse it. So, just seems like a good card. Next up, this is a fun one. A Priest Legendary, Dark Bishop Benedictus. 5 mana, 5, 6, start of game. If the spells in your deck are all shadow, enter shadow form. So this is very similar to Gen and Baku. It's got start of the game, some restriction, and then if you meet that condition... Uh, do something to your hero power. And the do something to your hero power, uh, make your hero power two mana deal two damage to a target, is very strong. So if you can support this card, it's a very good card. Now, making all the all the spells in your deck shadow spells, you do lose some powerful stuff, like Renew is a holy spell, Apotheosis is a good card. But you can still play, like, Raise Dead, I'm pretty sure, is a Shadow spell. Palm Reading, Insight, I believe both of those are Shadow spells. Oh yeah, we've also got Hysteria, that's a pretty important Shadow spell. Uh, Soul Mirror is a Shadow spell. Shadow or Death, obviously. Devouring Plague. So yeah, Priest definitely has a lot of good playable Shadow spells. Uh, the only real problem with this card is... Trying to figure out what the deck you uh, base around this looks like. Like, is this a minion based deck? And you just use Shadow Form as Steady Shot most of the time and just try to kill your opponent? Or is this like some sort of control deck and you use it, you know, like the Mage Hero Power to control the board in the early turns? It's pretty interesting, pretty open-ended. Um, I'm assuming that we'll probably get some more Shadow Spells in this set. So those spells will probably help shape the archetype that Benedictus wants to be played in, but uh, it's definitely an interesting card, and definitely in a vacuum this card is strong enough to see play. Uh, one thing to note, I'm like 90% sure what I'm about to say is true, but I'm pretty sure um, at the when they did the core set earlier in the year, I think they made it so that Shadow Form doesn't stack anymore. You used to be able to play Shadow Form, it made your hero power deal 2 damage, and then if you played a second Shadow Form, it made it deal 3 damage. I don't think it does that anymore, which is kind of a bummer, because with Benedictus and 2 Shadow Forms, maybe you could get up to 4 damage. That would be pretty sick. But I don't think it works like that anymore. And uh, maybe there's a good reason for that. That might be a little bit OP. 
Next up, we've got a neutral, or we've actually got a few neutrals to go through. Spice Bread Baker. Four mana, three, two. Battle Cry. Restore health to your hero equal to your hand size. So if you have six cards in your hand, this is restore six health to your hero. Um, just seems like a very good card. Reminiscent of Anti Keelbot, which was same card for five mana and it always healed for eight. You bump it down to four mana, that makes it a lot easier to play. Uh, four mana, three, two is a better stat line than five mana, three, three, probably. And this can heal for as much as Healbot, it can heal for up to nine. Um, in Warlock in particular, this card probably heals for eight or nine pretty much every time. This is just a really, really good card in Warlock because you always have such a big hand. It's particularly going to be good in the quest line deck because you want to deal damage to yourself. So this card is just kind of naturally very good support for that. But it could certainly see play in other classes as well, like some control shaman deck where this is just consistently healing for six. That's just pretty good. Uh, you know, a mage or like druids tend to have a lot of cards in their hand as well. So just seems like a good card. In theory, it could be played in like every class. Um, it's probably like a, a pretty fun card in the sense that it sort of enables you to play decks you really shouldn't be playing, like some control hunter nonsense. This probably helps you play stuff like that, but it's probably also just very competitive, at least in Warlock and probably in some other classes. Not really too much to say about it, honestly. God, she's got a big-ass hat, doesn't she? And those pastries are huge as well. I mean, I guess that's a bit of perspective, because she's holding it, like, between her head and the camera. But those pastries are, like, three times the size of her head. Anyway, Mailbox Dancer. Two mana, three, two, with Battle Cry, add a coin to your hand. Death Rattle, give your opponent one. So, two mana, three, two, give yourself a coin. We've actually seen that with Licensed Adventure, which was, uh... You needed to have a quest in play, and then it would give you a coin. And that card was actually surprisingly not that good. There were some decks that played quests and just didn't bother playing with that card. Because 2 mana 3 2 is not the greatest stat line. And giving yourself a coin is a bit situational. You can't even always abuse it. And I think this card is probably worse than that, because you have to give your opponent a coin also. So it doesn't really feel like you get much of an advantage out of this. But it is cool that there's just a neutral card that can let you do 11 mana combos or even 12 mana combos. That's just pretty fun for like deck building and playing at ranked floors and stuff. So I will probably be putting this card in some of my decks. But my first impression of it is that it doesn't seem very competitive. Unless there's something really specific you want to be ramping into. Like, this is probably a bad example, but the first thing that comes to mind is, like, maybe you're playing Control Shaman, and you consistently need to be able to play Tidal Wave on, like, turn 6 or 7. Then Mailbox Dancer can enable you to do that. But you're also giving your opponent a coin so that they can play something bigger to play around it. I don't know. My first impression of this card is not thinking it's very competitive. Next up, we have the Pandaren Importer. 2 mana 1 3 battle cry discover a spell that didn't start in your deck. So what this means is it's just a spell from your class that you did not put in your deck. So for example if you play this in priest, you're never going to be discovering palm reading because all your priest decks should already have palm reading in them. But uh, you can play this in the shadow form priest deck that can only have shadow spells and then you can discover renew, so that could be pretty good. Um, in general, this card does seem just, like, pretty playable. You can compare it to, like, Venomous Scorpid. Very similar battle cry, but you scale it down. One less mana, doesn't have poisonous. Seems fair. You can also sort of compare it to uh, Wand Thief. Wand Thief is actually very similar because it's not like you just load your deck with one mana spell. So you're getting a spell that didn't start in your deck, usually with Wand Thief. And uh, this is actually Discover instead of it being random. So, maybe this card actually compares pretty favorably to Wand Thief. I was planning to say that this card might just be hard to find a spot for because Wand Thief outclasses it, but the more I think about it, maybe this outclasses Wand Thief. 
or a uh, wand maker rather wand thief is the uh the combo card right so yeah i actually don't really have that much to say about this card but seems like it's probably competitive next up we have peasant one mana two one at the start of your turn draw a card so i don't know if this card is competitive but if it is it is going to be really really frustrating so your opponent is playing aggro they play this on turn one you can't immediately deal with it and they just get to draw an extra card every turn now it is a one mana two one so if you're mage or druid or rogue you can just hero power it but even in that situation this is kind of like forcing you to coin out a hero power if your opponent goes first and like that's kind of annoying and then there's always the world where you can't deal with it as you know warlock or whatever and it's you know kobold librarian but then it just keeps drawing cards every turn potentially so this card could potentially snowball a lot and in a really dangerous way but uh, that said it's going to depend entirely on whether or not a one mana two one is playable currently one mana two ones are probably not great because uh like face hunter for instance has a lot of one power stuff that can deal with this before you can even draw a card but I don't know, I guess outside of Face Hunter, it's really not that that easy to deal with. Seems like generally you're gonna have to like invest a card into killing this. I feel like this card is really, really dangerous and might end up being super broken. But yeah, it's gonna depend entirely on how easy it is to kill one mana two ones. If you can if this card is consistently killed, it's not good. If it's even kinda hard to deal with, then it's probably broken. Really, really scary card. And finally, we have Flightmaster Dungar, which is a neutral legendary, and it's actually available for free right now when you log into Hearthstone. It's going to be the one, like, special playable card for the next month. But uh, anyway, it's a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three with Battlecry. Choose a flight path and go dormant. Awaken with a bonus when you complete it. So your options are Westfall which is you go dormant for one turn, and when it wakes up, you summon a 2-2 adventurer with a random bonus effect. These are the adventurers from Wailing Caverns, the 2-2s that have, like, Rush or Poisonous or whatever. So 3-mana uh, 3-3, three three, three, dormant for one turn, and then you summon a 2-2 adventurer. Or you can go dormant for three turns, and when it wakes up, you heal your hero for 10. Or dormant for five turns when it wakes up, deal 12 damage randomly split among enemies so as i said before this card is actually available to play right now but i haven't had a chance to play with it myself so my first impression is that eastern plague lands where you have to go dormant for five turns is probably going to be pretty situational it's really slow and your opponent has a lot of time to react to uh, 12 damage randomly split among stuff. They can just play minions over five turns to soak up that damage. So it's not very reliable there. But the other two options, the dormant for three and then heal 10, and particularly the dormant for one and then summon a two, two, those both seem really strong to me. The Westfall option is really dangerously close to this card being a three mana five, five. And it's an option that you're pretty much happy to just play on curve every game, kind of regardless of what your opponent's doing. It's kind of like the go-to option. And then you can always fall back on Iron Forge if you're up against aggro. Uh, you play this on turn three, you get your healing on turn six, which is a bit delayed. But it's not likely that aggro is going to be able to deal 30 damage to you before turn six. Obviously it can happen, but... Basically, I'm just saying, I think this heal probably does come out in time to be relevant against aggro. So, all around, this card just seems very competitive. You've got your default tempo option. You've got your healing option in the aggro matchups. And then, occasionally, you've got your damage option if you're just up against, you know, priest or whatever. And you uh, need to be chipping away at them. So yeah, that's the 16 cards that have been revealed from United and Stormwind. Some interesting mechanics introduced, uh, the quest lines, 
seem pretty cool. I assume every class is getting a quest line. We've seen two already. Uh, we got the tradable keyword, which I'm very, very scared of. But uh, maybe I'm being a bit dramatic. And then we've got the weapons with kind of passive effects that I also assume every class is going to get a copy of. So a lot of interesting stuff going on in this set. And obviously I'm looking forward to playing with the cards when they come out, I assume, a month from now. <laughs>